that Rhode Island needs. And I don't know if you guys have seen these uh, bumper stickers, but there was this bumper sticker movement about five or six years ago where it talked about how Jesus is my co-pilot, right? Um, and so Jesus is my co-pilot. And so I wondered to really think about what that really means, right? So think about it. And next week I'm actually going to put a car like that up here, but um, not a real car, just some chairs. Don't don't trust it. But like, um, so Jesus is my co-pilot. So that means I'm the pilot, right? And so Jesus is my co-pilot. So Jesus over here. So if you ever talk to a co-pilot or seen pilots on planes, right? The co-pilot's over here and the co-pilot gives suggestions to the pilot. The co-pilot assists the pilot, but the pilot can make the final decisions. The pilot is the one everyone in the cabin hears. The pilot is the one everyone in the cabin knows because um, the pilot is the one that gets all the notoriety, all the fame, because that's the pilot and this is the co-pilot. And if you ever thought about what it means for Jesus to be your co-pilot, that means Jesus can suggest some things to you. Jesus can say a couple things. Jesus can do some things. But at the end of the day, I am the pilot. I'm in control. And I believe some of us have relationships with Jesus where Jesus is literally your co-pilot. Some scriptures suggest some things to you. Some scriptures say some things to you. Jesus will influence you to help make you some decisions. But at the end of the day, I'm the pilot and I can do whatever I want, how I please. And if something gets too far off, the co-pilot who's still in school can help me out a little bit, doesn't make as much as I make, doesn't have as much influence as I have, can't give the wings away like I can give them because I am the pilot. So then there was this movement that said, no, nah, Jesus is not my co-pilot. I'm the co-pilot. He's the pilot. So let's think through this, right? Because think about if you're a co-pilot, your end goal is to become a pilot. And so if I'm the co-pilot, that means constantly I'm given the pilot suggestions on how to get to our final destination. And at the end of the day, I desire to be the pilot. So there are times I'm going to shut my mouth because eventually I can do this thing better than you. Eventually I can get to that seat. I want to be in that seat. And think about some of our relationships with Jesus. Some of us are in those positions and in those areas where we're fighting God and saying, you know what, eventually I can do it better than you. This is what you should have done to those people. This is what you should do on my job. This is how you should handle these things. When you encounter turbulence, God, I understand what you want to do, but let me give you some suggestions on how to handle this turbulence. And too many of us get caught up in these pilot and co-pilot battles where either we're fighting comparison or we're fighting control. We're fighting comparison or fighting control. And as I was praying through this for this year, what it means to talk about Jesus and what God might be challenging so many of us to do is to forgive ourselves for wanting to be the pilot or the co-pilot and just get in the back seat. Because when I get in the back seat, I'm, I'm, telling my, I'm telling the driver, I trust you. And could it be some of us trust our Uber drivers more than we trust God? Could it be that some of us trust pilots on planes more than we trust God? We trust the pilot's going to get us someplace where we can't even see what's in front of us. But God is saying, listen, I want you to trust me that God is challenging us to get in the back seat. Because when I get in the back seat, it's saying, God, I trust the driver to take me where I need to go. If we encounter turbulence, the driver knows exactly how to get past it. If we need to refuel, the driver knows where to stop. If we get through some storms or bad ter terrain, the driver knows how to take care of it. Because when I sit in the back seat, I trust the driver driver. It could be the reason some of us haven't seen God work miracles in our lives is because, because we keep trying to jump in the front seat to control things, jump in the front seat to compare ourselves that eventually we'll get past it. Because when you look throughout scripture so often when Jesus tells us to go and to do and to become it's all about making disciples. But when it comes to trusting him God says to be still, to know and to believe. Because you cannot become in the world until you believe first in Jesus Christ. And so as we think about this and how we work through this, that's the story we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, a part of our vision text for this year. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, you have your Bible, so I want you to see this story. I want you to see something very powerful in this text today that I want to pull out to share with you. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Um, and a lot of times we don't read first and second Chronicles because if you read most of Chronicles, it's just like so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. But hidden in Chronicles, in both First and Second Chronicles, are some stories. You get the story of Jabez, you get the prayer of Jabez, you get Solomon's story. Um, and Solomon didn't just write a lot of Proverbs, but Solomon did a lot of great stuff in, in the kingdom. And so I want you to see this story. And our vision text is Second Chronicles chapter 7, but I want you to see what sets up Second Chronicles chapter 7. So Second Chronicles chapter 6, beginning at verse number 40. Look at what Solomon says to the people. Solomon says, Now my God, 
if you want to underline something or highlight something, highlight those three words. Now, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now, arise, Lord God, and come from your resting place, and you take the ark of your might. May your priest, Lord God, be clothed in salvation, and may your faithful people rejoice in your goodness. Lord God, do not reject your anointed one, and remember the great love you promised to David, your servant. The three words I want you to grab today are now, my God. Lessons from the back seat. Now, my God. So here's what's going on in the text. Solomon had just finished building the temple with the people. And in chapter 6, we see the first sermon, if you will, Solomon getting up and proclaiming to the people the begin in the beginning of chapter 6 and all the way to the end of chapter 6. And Solomon tells us, here it is, David gave the plans, but because of David's sin, David fell. Solomon came along, he built the temple from the plans that David had. And so Solomon established is now, what's the purpose of the temple? Well, if you have your Bible, ch ch chapter 6, verse 1, you look at what Solomon says. Solomon says, the purpose of the temple, watch this, was not to honor David, was not to honor Solomon, was not to honor the priest, was not just for music and, and the minstrels, was not just for the people to come to. David says, I mean, Solomon says, the purpose of the temple, verse 1, the Lord said he would dwell in thick darkness, but I built a, a temple to be, a, but an exalted temple for you to have your place of residence forever. The Lord said he'd be in darkness, Genesis 1. But Solomon says God has challenged them to build a temple where God will have a residence forever. So why is that so important? If you remember, what the people of Israel did for years is they would carry around the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was this massive thing that said the glory of God rested in the Ark of the Covenant. And so the people of Israel, it would take four people to carry the Ark of the Covenant no matter where they would go. And if anyone who was not anointed, who was not covered, touched the Ark, they would die immediately. So the people of Israel for so many years had been wandering people. They had been wandering people that goes all the way back to when Moses led them out of Egypt to going to now Moses was dead. Joshua came up. Joshua led the people. David led the people. They had been wandering people. But now when Solomon comes along, he builds this massive temple for God's glory. They went from a wandering people to a people where now God can rest in their midst. And Solomon says the purpose of this place is for God to dwell and to have residence in his temple. What am I trying to say? For some of you, 2018 was a year where you were constantly wandering. You're wandering from friendship to friendship, relationship to relationship, job to job, worry to anxiety, insecurity to depression. You're wandering all over the place. But the challenge that God gives you as you begin 2019 is to have a place in your life where God can take residence and take residence rest in your life. Because when God begins to rest in your life, then you can encounter the glory of God, I wish y'all, in your life. When God begins to rest in your life, you move from worrying if God is there, because now you have a prayer closet where you know God sits there. You move from wondering if God will meet you on your job to creating an altar at your job that God has to meet you there. That you move from a wandering person to a rest-filled person. And look at this restful prayer that Solomon prays. Solomon prays all through chapter 6. And what Solomon shows us is with the movement of glory in Solomon's life, he says, number one, I'm not going to take the credit. See, too often after we build something that's awesome, that's beautiful, we love taking the credit. But Solomon says, I'm not going to take your credit. But look at what Solomon does in chapter 6 around verse 5. Solomon builds an altar unto God because God fulfilled every single one of his promises. Let me tell you something. You serve a God who will fulfill every promise that he's spoken over your life and the challenge is for you not to take credit for what God did but to create an altar where you can worship because of what God did for you. Because when you create an altar where you are, you are declaring that this is a place where where God fulfills his promises. And I'm going to pause right there for some folk up in the building this morning who can testify in your own life. When you look at your job, you need to create an altar on your job because God fulfilled all of his promises. When you look
look at your marriage, you create an altar in your marriage because this is where God fulfilled his promises. When you go back to school, you create an altar on your school because this is where God fulfilled all of his promises. And here's the shout, when I create an altar at my job, when I create an altar at my school, God's got to bring glory. God, I wish y'all to win. Am I talking to anybody? This is a year where I don't need to be on stage. I want God's glory. This is a year I don't need my name called. I want his glory. This is a year I don't need my name in the paper. I want his glory. This is a year where I don't need somebody to know me. I want the glory of God because with the glory of God comes healing. I wish y'all. With the glory of God comes acceleration. With the glory of God comes finances. With the glory of God, am I talking to anybody up in the building at the early service who can say, God, I don't need my name called. I want your glory all around me. See, that's why I'm telling you right now, church, this is a year even for our church. Let me tell you something. As Solomon declared over the people, this will be a space where every time you walk into these four doors, every time these doors unlock, you will encounter the glory of God. This is not a place for divisiveness. This is not a place for insecure, for, for insecure people to fight other folk. This is not a place to talk about one another's sin, but this is a place where when I walk in these doors, I'm going to see the glory of of God. You will be corrected by the glory. I wish y'all. You will be convicted by the glory. You will be comforted by the glory because I want the glory on this pulpit. I wish y'all. I want the glory on our instruments. I want the glory on our microphones. I want the glory in every one of our pews. And I wish I had somebody up in this church this morning who can say every time I walk in these doors, I want to encounter the glory of God that will give me discernment, give me clarity, so this is not a place to fight. It's a place to see glory. This is not a place to hurt someone. This is a place to see glory. Because every time I walk in here, I'm creating an altar to see the glory of God. Solomon says, as we create this temple, as we build this temple, it's all about the glory. And here's the good news for every single one of you. All of you don't need to be a pastor, don't need to be a deacon, don't need to be a prophet to encounter the glory of God. The glory of God is available to everyone. You don't need to speak in tongues to get the glory. You don't need to know a certain song to get the glory. But the moment you create an altar and say, God, I'll worship you here, is the moment God says, I can send glory to your job. I can send glory to the gym. I can send glory to your school. I can send glory to your home. You create an altar and God will send glory right there. And Solomon says all of this in chapter 6. He begins to outline all the reasons why the people had exempted themselves from glory. And then I love the way Solomon ends the story. Solomon gets to around verse number 39. And as Solomon ends the story, Solomon says, listen, I want to remind you that a lot of you are consumed thinking that the only reason this temple will have authority is because my father gave the plans and I built it. And Solomon says, do not waste your time trying to find the person to focus on in the temple. Because Solomon says, I'm not the focal point of the temple. They my father David's not the focal point of the temple. The priests are not the focal point of the temple. Um, matter of fact, y'all ain't even the focal point of the temple. But God is the focal point of this temple. And Solomon shows us in verses 22 to 39, if any of you ever come in this temple and don't want God to be the focal point of why you come in here, don't walk in. Watch, you can go read the text for yourself. If any of you want to come into this temple and don't want to encounter the glory of of God, it's better off you stayed home. But if you come here, you can read the text for yourself. If you come here, Solomon says, don't focus on Solomon. Don't focus on the father. Don't focus on the priests. Don't focus on the minstrels. Matter of fact, don't even focus on one another. See, that's why I love the movie Bird Box so much. Because Bird Box, he literally says, I'm going to cover my eyes. And all I can do is be in a space where I can hear everything around me. I can still move, but I ain't focused on anything but making sure I'm taken care of. Solomon says, I'm going to put myself in the backseat. Here's why. Because our community needs Jesus, not Solomon. I wish y'all. Yes, I'm the king. Yes, I have authority. Yes, I'm well known. But let me tell you something. The community can find another pastor. The community doesn't need me. The community doesn't need you. The community doesn't need our music. The community needs Jesus. And the good news for all of us is God uses all of our broken selves to get Jesus into our world. See, we don't need music, but we need Jesus. Our battles need Jesus. Our wounds 
thrones need Jesus, our future needs Jesus, and Solomon says, I'm going to get in the back seat because I don't want anyone to look at me, but I want folk to see that God can still send glory through broken people. But God challenges us this year, church, to stop trying to control how God moves and let the glory lead you. That's why God needs people who want to seek his glory. I want to see the glory. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Watch the text. When you seek to build the kingdom of God, Jesus says everything you need to make that happen. He said, you don't have to buy it. I'll gift it to you. I want to see the glory. So Solomon models for us what it means to get in the back seat. And I'm going to show you this, which I want you to underline it, and I'm finished. Solomon says, how do I get in the back seat? How do I get to a mindset where I can teach the people? people how to get in the back seat. And three words Solomon says in verse number 40, Solomon says, now my God. Now the reason that's so powerful is because of verses 41 through 42. Solomon stands up and says, now my God. May your eyes be open and your ears attentive. But here's what's powerful, verses 41 through 42. When Solomon focuses on the people, he says, then Lord God, you arise. Priests, Lord God. Priests, Lord God. Lord God, don't reject me. There's two different Hebrew words there. Because the first one in verse number 40 talks about a personal God, relationship with God. Verses 41 through 42 talks about a communal relationship relationship with God. And what Solomon shows us is the only reason I have authority in the community is because I've got some authority in my own private spaces, God. And Solomon speaks about Lord God because Solomon knows my God. That, that's it. I, I want you to grab a hold of this today, that Solomon knows my God because you cannot have public authority without some private prayers. You cannot have public authority. Don't you dare think you can talk about Jesus to other people if you're not intentional about talking to Jesus all by yourself. Solomon says, the reason I can call Lord God is because I know my God. The reason I can talk about Lord God is because I have a relationship with my God. You know you've matured when you've gotten to a place where you have a my God testimony and a my God relationship. Not my mama's God, but he's my God. I wish y'all. Not my daddy's God, but he's my God. Not my pastor's God. God, but he's my God. Not my director's job, but he's my God. Because it was my God that healed me. I wish y'all. It was my God that set me free. It was my God that gave me that job. It was my God that opened that door for me. It was my God. You don't have to tell me he's good. I can testify that he's my God. And it was a my God testimony that Solomon was able to get up and say, now Lord God, you do the rest of the work. Because you have public authority after you have some private prayers. If you're not talking to God privately, don't think you can engage with others about God publicly. And my challenge to some of you who are wondering about gospel conversations, the first place to start is not going to talk about Jesus to others. The first place to start is you talking to Jesus all by yourself. You can talk to God in your home, on your job, in the gym, at the school, in your social private conversations. You can talk about God anywhere. You can talk to him while you're driving. You can talk to him while you're at a stoplight. You can talk to him when you come into church. You can talk to him on the outside of church. You can talk to him at the coffee shop. You can talk to him, and you can talk to him at the mall. You can talk to him on your job. That's why David said, where can I go? Because if I go up to the highest place, you're right there. I can still talk to you. If I go to the lowest place, you're right there, and I can still talk to you. You get in your worst place of sin, you can still talk to him. You get your highest level of success, you can still talk to him. There's no place you can exempt yourself from a my God opportunity. So you grow into a place like Solomon, where Solomon had public authority because he knew he had some private power. How strong is your personal relationship with Jesus? When you speak about Jesus, are you speaking from a place of authority? I mean that you and God have a relationship. You and God know one another. Or when you speak, are you speaking from a place of insecurity because really you haven't had a relationship or you've talked to God by yourself, so you feel the need to call on someone to pray for you because you and God are not having conversations. Here's the good news. God makes God's self available to each and every one of us. The writer of Hebrews put it like this. He said he, he's a rewarder. He, he speaks to those who diligently seek him. I want you to hear what the writer says. He says because in Hebrews 11 and 6, because anyone who approaches God must believe that he exists, but watch this, and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. 
That's so powerful. Do you believe and do you agree that God cares enough about you to respond to you when you call on his name? That's a my God relationship. So we're going to get to verses 41 through 42 next week. We're going to get to all that next week. But I wanted to put on you today as you go into this year a my God relationship. Because some of you, like the disciples even in, Matthew, in the book Gospel of Matthew, when Matt, Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples, and he looked at them and said, listen, are y'all tired? Are you worn out? Uh, are, you trying to, are you tired of trying to do things all by yourself? And Jesus shows them. Before you all could go into the world to share the gospel, before you all can go into the world to talk about others, Jesus says, hold on, come unto me, all who have heavy burdens, take the yoke off of you, put the yoke on me, and I'll give you rest. I love the way the message translation puts it. The message translation puts it like this, are you tired? Are you worn out from doing it on your own? Look what Jesus says. Jesus says, walk with me, work with me and watch how I do it. So I'm thinking about all of you in the room today. I want you to think about your 2018. Are you tired? Are you worn out? When you think about your 2019, does it just make you tired? Does it make you worn out? When you think about what you have to do at work just tomorrow, are you tired? Are you worn out? Here's what Jesus says. Come unto me, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. And I love the ending of that verse. It says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Jesus will teach you pace when you say, Jesus, I'm yielding myself to you and I want to be, I want you not just to be a part of my life, but you know what, Jesus, you get in the front seat, I'll get in the back seat, I'll put my headphones on, I'll put my favorite movie on, and I trust that no matter where you take me, you're going to take me to a place where your glory will be revealed and I can worship you in spirit and truth. I don't know where you are today, I don't know what you're dealing with today, but I can only imagine, and God, the reason God prompted me to do this is because so many of you, like myself, are trying to have so much control over your life. If I can control this, if I can fix this, if I can do this, if I can add this, if I can email this, if I can call this, if I can put this, if I can pay for this, and God is saying, get out of the front seat. You're not the pilot, you're not the co-pilot. But I love my son. My son's favorite show is Sesame Street. And whenever we have a long drive, we put an iPad in the back seat. He gets in this car seat. He, clo- he sits there and watches the show. He doesn't look outside the window. He doesn't look up front with us because our son knows his parents are not going to take him someplace where he'll be harmed. His son knows his parents are going to lead him someplace that might be good for him. He may enjoy it or may not enjoy it. But our son trusts his parents. I pray that you don't trust your Uber driver more than you trust God. I pray you don't trust the airplane pilot more than you trust God. But I pray that this is a week where you get in the back seat and you say, God, where you lead me, I'll follow. I'll go with you all the way. That's what leads us to communion. Communion is this beautiful story where Jesus is showing us the power of his leading and guiding. And that, God, we accept the grace that you've given us. If you have the communion elements with you, if you don't, there's some in the back. Uh, and the communion for us is this wonderful place where it literally says, you know what, Jesus, I want your shed blood to become a part of me. I want, the, I want your broken body to become a part of me so that now, God, I understand what it means to walk with you, to work with you, and to watch how you do it. So in this moment, <clears throat> if those of you today, if you're in a position where you've been trying to be in control, You've been trying to be in the front seat. You've been trying to tell God, give him suggestions how to do things. Here's a challenge I give you today. Um, I'm going to pray for you, and then as, you, as I pray for you, uh, and you can talk to God in your own way, uh, but you and God have a conversation as if you're sitting in the upper room with Jesus. And as you talk to Jesus, when Jesus tells you, take my broken body, take the blood, and be a, make it a part of you, I want you to listen to the promptings that Jesus gives you, because today is a day I pray where you stop trying to be in control. Father, today, we're grateful for the privilege to be close to you. We're grateful, God, that you give us the chance to walk with you, to work with you, and to watch how you do it. Today, Father, as we sit across the table from you, um, as you get ready to go into a place of purpose, Father, show us today how this communion can lead us into purpose. Take away the rituals, take away the traditionalism, take away, take away just the names of Eucharist and communion. But Father, right now, allow us to sit across from you to see your hands, to see your feet, and challenge us, God, to be your hands and feet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In your